Hey folks, how you doing? Um, we're going to be heading up to, uh, to do some landscaping work in a few minutes. But before I left, I thought I'd uh, start a fire just to kind of take the chill off the house. It's, um, it's about 48 degrees, it's overcast, late October. So people who are wood burners, what they'll do is, um, you know, you'll just burn a, a small fire just to take the chill off and then just let it go out and that's enough to, to do just that. But uh, I have some, some very sad news to all the folks that have been watching me split wood for years. Can you hear that? You hear that sound? You see that foam coming on the end of the wood? I know any wood burners are cringing just watching this. But um, this wood was covered by a tarp for like two years. So yeah, it's seasoned, but it sure as heck isn't dry. And it's, you know, it's completely my fault for not, for not drying it out. But uh, I, better get, uh, I better get going and, you know, put them in a holes housing or put them under my woodshed there where, you know, the, the tarp covers the wood, but it doesn't let air circulate. So you want it to be covered and have the ability for air to circulate. And if you don't, you get the fizzy wood and it just doesn't light for squat. All my stove has is a baffle. There's a baffle up top, so it heats the, the air. The air goes up and then it's got a baffle just to slow the air down. Whereas the modern stoves have either pipes up top or a catalytic converter to allow for secondary combustion to, to clean the air a little bit better. But for the older stoves, when you're starting them, you leave the door ajar and that gives it just a ton of air coming in which the fire wants to get started um, and then once it gets going you, you just close the door. So I have one of these smoke thermometers on there and I, I really don't look at it too often. I mean I know what setting to put the stove on where it's going to be smoke free but usually if I get it above 300 here uh, there's going to be no smoke. Uh, the exception is is when you first put wood on, it's got to get the, the water out. No matter how dry the wood is, you're going to get a little bit of smoke getting the water out. But usually when I put the wood on, I'll let it, I'll let it heat up to like 450 or 500, and then I'll throttle it down a little bit and go for the long burn. So that, uh, that is what we're looking at for the chimney. Hopefully you're seeing, you know, you're seeing that smoke coming out of there. And, um, if that wood was dry within 10 minutes, I could get that to be perfectly clear smoke, but it's going to take a little bit longer. So uh, my weekend project is going to be to get some of that wood uh, covered, but with air flowing through it, so this doesn't happen again. So I just want to show you folks that the temperature in the room right now is uh, 60 degrees, which is, I believe I've got the thermostat set to 60. But in the winter, uh, with a drafty house like mine, 60 degrees is, is freaking cold, and there's definitely a chill right now. So it's been 10 or 15 minutes, and the, the fire is getting, getting going. I've got the two air vents on the front open all the way. I've got the two air vents on the side open all the way, and we're just gonna leave them that way. And the temperature is uh, getting a little bit warmer. And I think you can, uh, can you feel the heat coming off that stove? Feels pretty nice. So, um, yes, I do need to clean the pipes in my stove. Yes, I do need to dry out the wood. But I thought I would just share that, you know, you're not the only one with wet wood. All right, and then if you guys take a look at the chimney, um, yes, it's still got some smoke coming, but the smoke is starting to, you know, dial down a bit. And uh, once we get it up, you know, like another 50 or 100 degrees on that thermometer, Pretty much the smoke will go clear, but again, because we just put wood on the fire, you still, no matter how hot your fire is burning or how dry your wood is, there's always gonna be a little bit of smoke when you first put wood on the fire, because it's burning off whatever moisture's in the wood, which comes out in the form of uh, white smoke, you know, that's the water vapor. And for anybody who's still curious, I have not planted any of the shrubs that, uh, that I picked up last week. Hey folks, we're, um, we're at today's job and today is the first day here 
And what I'm trying to do with this house, um, I, I installed this landscape in the late 90s. Um, I was called and asked to, to, to redo the landscape. And, and I said we could probably just cut everything back, clean it up, as opposed to starting fresh, because all it really needs is a good pruning and weeding. So, um, so what I want to do today is just kind of walk you through. You can see how I did things 20 years ago, um, see how to control things are, and you know, with with situations like this, what what I'll usually do, pretty much with all jobs, is I just try to get there the first day and soak in what's going on and, and do a little bit of work. And then I'll kind of start to get a feel for where I want to work next and what I want to do. And, and I'd love to say, you know, just, just get there and blow it out. Um, that, that works. Um, but for me, um, this is just usually the way it works. I don't know, every time I go to a house, there's always some birds making noises. But uh, let's, um, let's, let's walk you around a bit. And I forgot to say that today is today. So if you're watching this movie today, I filmed it today. Can you see him up there? I, I can't tell with the clouds. But you hear that noise? So back when I did this landscape, I was still in my... Um, Oh, that's got to be a bird's nest. There has got to be a bird's nest. Did you see that? There has got to be a bird's nest in that shrub. And I wouldn't be surprised if the reason those birds are making all that noise is because they're trying to distract me from the bird's nest. And I am about to go in there and do a heavy pruning on that very same shrub, wonderful. Yeah, who wants to get mauled today? So the bird just flew in over here. There's a nest right there. I don't know if it's the active nest or not. So when I did this landscape, it was late 90s. Ornamental grasses were still the rage. So the, you know, penicetum, and sedum uh, mixture for fall interest was the rage. Uh, I don't really do this anymore because penicetum turns out is, is what I consider high maintenance. I mean, yeah, all you have to do is cut it back in the fall, but it's a pain in the butt to cut back, in my opinion. And then eventually what'll happen is it, um, every year it spreads a little bit bigger and then you get this, this hole in the center of the plant. But I mean, I don't think anybody ever divided these, so maybe in the right situation, they are a good plant. Um, this shrub right here is called Enchianthus campanulatus. And I think I planted these as either a three or a five gallon shrub. But uh, Enchianthus is in the same family. I have to think about this a bit. I think it's in the rhododendron family. But uh, it's, it's supposed to have a really nice fall color, which it's just starting to get. Uh, it's got these little fruits on it. And then, you know, the new growth has this reddish color. I haven't really used it much lately because it's, it's tough to find in nurseries. Um, but this is Enchianthus campanulatus. And then uh, over here, this is also Enchianthus campanulatus. And I, I guess it's too bad we're not here a little bit later to really see that color. Um, this, this weed right here, just so everybody knows, this is thistle. This has um, spines on it, spikes on it. So don't just grab it. Um, make sure you put some gloves on, and we might do a video later about how to remove this uh, without hurting yourself. Um, I had done a paver sidewalk back when I did this landscape. I was doing uh, pavers too, so this has been replaced since I did it, but the sidewalk, you know, I did this sidewalk years ago, but it would have, it would have been, you know, the pavers from back in the 90s, the um, octagonal pavers with the little key on them, and then I did a, 
you know, you would do some bricks on the edge to, to keep your cuts controlled. But, um, we've got, uh, I think this is Olga rhododendron. And somebody corrected me the other day and said it's Olga Mezit in a comment, and you're right. Um, in the trade, we just call it Olga. We know there's only Olga, but I mean, I guess if you want to be a stickler, you can. Um, this is what they look like after, you know, 20 years. Um, I got my holly, uh, my blue holly, on either side of the front door, which I think I still do quite often. If it works, why change it? You got the beautiful berries in the fall. Um, the one thing I want you to notice though is, you know, whoever's been pruning this, I don't maintain this landscape. So, you know, whoever's been pruning this has been doing the yearly shearing in June or July, which is what everybody does. I mean, I can't, this is just the way it's done, but um, they, they never come back and prune the back of the, uh, the planting. So then you get stuff like this, and then you get stuff like that on the house. Uh, my house has that stuff without shrubs on it, so what, what can you say, but this is, um, you know, this is what shrubs look like after they're sheared for years. And then over here, this is uh, Father Gilla Gardenii. So this would have been like a three gallon shrub I would have planted. And this is really the best illustration of how Father Gilla grows. It's got this, um, this suckering habit, which Again, this is over 20 years growth and it's it's spread out. I think it's kind of cool. But um, I still do use Father Gila Gardenia because it only grows three to four feet tall. Bottle brush white flowers in the spring, but um, eventually it does start to sucker. It, it, it's a slowly suckering shrub, but it does sucker. So I've just said sucker how many times now? And then, um, Black-Eyed Susan. I, I don't do Black-Eyed Susan very often anymore because Black-Eyed Susan spreads like wildfire in the landscape. So if you're going to do it, make sure it's a meadow or something because if you just put a few, it's going to turn into this. So we will cut back, you know, deadhead it and thin it out a bit to make it, to make it smaller. Again, more thistle, just a ton of thistle in here. More sedum. Um... At this stage, I was doing, I think that's a Wiltoni juniper, Juniperus horizontalis Wiltoni, and then this is probably a barberry, and the idea here was to do like three, one, two, three Wiltonis, and then the barberry behind, but what happened is that the barberry reverted, and, um, you know, there's a lot of hubbub in Connecticut about invasive and non-invasive barberry and the nurseries are all trying to sell the non-invasive types and these are barberry seeds which if the birds carry into the woods will grow and, and keep spreading the barberry so you know you're darned if you do you're darned if you don't right but um I don't really do, I, I, like, I do like Barberry, I do like, uh, the Bagatelle is a really nice compact one. Don't do the, the horizontalis junipers, the spreading junipers much anymore. They look great in the first like five to six years, but then they eventually start to thin out and they just keep spreading and they, they thin out basically. That's what happens to most of the ones I plant. Another Anchianthus campanulatus, and then uh, that is, uh, it's, I believe it's another Father Gila. But for some reason, this one didn't get pruned. And then this was a kind of cool touch back in the day. I, I thought it was a cool touch. Is, um, you know, you've got your uh, flowering dogwood, Cornus florida, native. Birds love these, uh, birds love these, these fruits here. And then you can see, this is actually right there, that's next, next year's blooms. 
But this stayed. It was kind of sickly looking back then. So I pruned this up, got away from the house, and then I planted this uh, moon shadow. I think it's moon shadow euonymus, which I thought was a nice touch to, to lighten the area up. So um, if you've got deer, don't plant this, but I thought that was pretty cool. And then on the side of the house, I did have some arborvitae. I just did like a row of arborvitae and a couple um, pyres, japonica, which I can't think of the pyres, japonica. I can't think of the common name right now, but you know, early spring, bell-shaped flowers, weeping shrub. I'll think of it. But, um, this is, uh, you know, this is what I did, and, and, you know, over time, things get out of hand. So, so my mission, uh, which I chose to accept, is to um, hack and whack and, and get everything back in shape, and, you know, what I'll do is, well, first I want to I wanna clear out the front door because Halloween is in two days now, so once I do that, um, you know, cut back or deadhead uh, the um, black-eyed Susan. All this thistle has to, I have to get down on my knees with my weeding knife and, and dig them out one at a time. And there's a bird in there. I hear the bird in there. I, I got to make sure I wear goggles today and figure out where the nest is before I start pruning that so I don't get uh, mauled or leave this poor bird open all winter. Um, so we're going to dig out all the uh, thistle, just just whack back the father gilla, and then, you know, heavy prune the, um, the blue holly as well. So we'll be here for a while. Dig out this sucker, prune the moon shadow, I think it's moon shadow, prune the moon shadow Euonymus a ton, and um, we'll get there, but it's going to take time.